When you are going to be bringing in Photoshop artwork into Flash, uh, one recommendation that I will make is that you label your layers in Photoshop because then when you bring the artwork into Flash, it will maintain those layer names, making your job easier to figure out what is on each layer. So it is worth the time to put names on your layers. So double click on the text next to a layer, change it from layer 23 or whatever the name happens to default as to what it actually is. So this document here is the background. There is a face and you'll notice that there's some parts missing on it. It's a little bit disturbing but that's okay because we do have the replacement parts that will be able to then be animated and worked with accordingly. Now you will notice that there is transparency here. That transparency is maintained when the artwork is then brought into Flash. That's one of the advantages of using the layered Photoshop document. You can export your layers as individual PNGs with transparent backgrounds and bring those in if you so desire. But there really is very little to gain by doing so and just bringing in a layered PSD is probably the fastest and easiest way to go. So once you have your document set and ready to go, then in your Flash document, when you want to bring your artwork into that file, the artwork does get embedded, it's not linked to it, so once you have the artwork in your file, you don't have to Make sure that you keep the PSD and keep the flash file in the same folder because it's not referencing it. It's now embedded the content of that file into your flash file. So if you bring in tons of bitmap graphics for backgrounds and characters and whatever else you need for your animation, you all quickly watch your flash file balloon in size. So uh, do try and bring things in at the size you need them in your animation. So if you need them really small, but you bring it in really huge and scale it down in Flash, you're just kind of wasting processor power and file size. So scale it to the size that you're going to be working with. To bring content into Flash, you can use import. And when you want it to bring it in, maintain the layers, maintain alignment and everything, it's nice to use import to stage. Importing it to the stage will then put it onto the stage of your document. So make sure that your playback head is at the frame that you want the artwork to start, and it will then bring that in. You'll notice it's Command R. You wait. And navigate to your file. Now, the import screen that comes up, it will show you the layers that are available for import. So if you have your layered Photoshop file, you do not have to bring in every layer. You can pick and choose which layer you want to bring in. And the layers that will show up checked here are the layers that are currently set to visible in Photoshop. So that if in Photoshop you had turned off a layer, if I turned off those two layers, then when I got to the import in Flash, I would have seen those two layers not checked. So it knows which layers are visible and which layers are not, and remembers that during the import process, which is handy. So you can choose the layers that you want to bring in. Now this little icon here with the tree indicates it's going to be a bitmap graphic that it's bringing in, which is what we already know. And now if I click on a layer here, we'll see that there are a couple more options available to me. So that because I'm bringing this in, I can now choose if I'm concerned about file size, I can choose to use the publish setting that Flash is going to use when it publishes my document. And I can then modify kind of how compressed it makes that 
image so that it makes it lower quality or higher quality. And the reason we care about that is because of file size. So in the finished published file, we might care about file size. For the purposes of this project, we do not. So we typically do not um, want to over compress our images. But if you are working on banner ads where file sizes are mandatory to adhere to, then at that point we do have to be concerned about it. Now you will remember in previous lessons we talked about if you want to animate something it's best to turn it into a movie clip. It gives you more options and allows you to do things a little bit easier. There's a little checkbox right here where it says create movie clip for this layer. So we can actually take each of these layers and have Flash during the import process create movie clips out of each one so it's ready to go. I would advocate that you do that because that's just it's easier just to check the box and let it do it for us versus manually selecting each piece of artwork and saying convert this to a symbol, choose movie clip, name it. It's much easier just to take care of it now. And even better is if I shift click and choose all of the layers, I can just click and now we can see the symbol has changed and it's now showing us what is the movie clip icon, the little kind of corner of a gear. So if when we're looking at our library for our document where we see the different symbol types, we will now see that these are going to be coming in as movie clips. So my recommendation is to do that. Set layers at their original position so it maintains the alignment they had in Photoshop. And it also recognizes that this Photoshop file that I'm bringing in does not match the dimensions of my Flash project. My Flash project currently is defaulting to 550 by 400 and the picture I'm bringing in is 640 by 480 so it's aware of that and I can choose to scale my project to match my Photoshop if that's the size I want it to be so I want it to be an exact match to what I'm bringing in from Photoshop. If I don't want to do that then I make sure that that bottom box is not checked down here. So it's a choice that I can make. If I want to see the whole picture, I can do that. If I don't, I can leave that unchecked. I'm going to leave it unchecked so we can see the difference when we bring it in. But I will bring things in as movie clips. Hit OK. There it is. And now if I look down on the bottom in my timeline, I will see the layers it brought in, it's maintained their names, the same names that those layers had inside of Photoshop. So now I have all of my layers named. I don't want to move them, I want to turn them off so you can see there's a background, there's the face, there's the mouth, and there's one eye, and there's the other eye. So now I have my different pieces brought in and ready to start animating. When it comes time to bring in your audio, Flash supports three audio formats that you can import into your Flash project. MP3, WAV, and AIFF. Now, it doesn't really care which you use. When you're working on the Mac, you can use AIFF, which is the default Mac audio format. WAV is the default Windows audio format. MP3 is an already compressed audio file. I personally use a WAV most often so that I never have to worry when I'm going back and forth between Mac and Windows. That being said, there have been instances where some WAV files have been rejected by Flash and it gets really grumpy about it. The number one thing to keep in mind is that you need to make sure that your audio is at CD quality or less. So 4416 stereo or lower quality and then it generally will import. So after downloading my music and wanting to bring my music into my Flash project, well notice the library here, when you import a PSD it puts it into a nice tidy folder which is handy, it keeps your library clean and organized. And then you will see that I have my movie clip symbols. And then I have the bitmaps 
that are being used to make those and it puts those into a subfolder called assets. So it keeps things nice and tidy. Now, audio is a little bit different than artwork in Flash. The thing to remember about audio is audio is a property of a frame. So audio, we don't drag it to the stage and put it on, but we attach it to a frame through the properties panel. So the recommendation is that you have separate layers for your audio. And I mean that as in layers, plural. You can have as many layers for audio as you need and it's often going to occur that you will have music, you will have sound effects, you will have voice in your project. You could create one complete final mix down where you have recorded all of those, work out the timing and save it out as one single MP3 or WAV or AIFF file and then try and match your animation to it. But it's much easier if your audio pieces are all separate assets. So each sound effect is separate, each little clip of dialogue is separate, each music track is separate, and then you have them separated onto a reasonable number of layers so that you can control where they play based on keyframes. So I'm going to add a new layer, and that will be my music layer. Currently it's empty, we can see it's an empty keyframe, there's nothing there. Now I need to import the audio into my project. Well the audio lives in the library, so import to library works, but even if I were to choose import to stage, it doesn't actually put it on the stage because audio is a property of a keyframe, it's not a visible thing. We can't see audio, so it makes sense that it doesn't go onto the stage. So I have a short and long version of the audio that I downloaded and I will import those. So I select the files and I will choose open and we will see that absolutely nothing happened except the fact that here they are. They are now in my library. I recommend that when you have your project <coughs> folder that you put your flash file into a folder, you keep any PSDs or other JPEGs, PNGs, or whatever else you've brought into your project in that project folder. Even though the artwork does get embedded, it's good to keep the original. And also have all of your audio assets in that project folder because it's very common that you have to go back and edit those. You have extremely limited ability to modify the playback of audio in Flash. The recommended course of action is to modify the audio in an audio editing program and then re-import or relink to it. That is the better way to do it. So here we can see files exist in my library. I click on this keyframe and you will see in my property panel frame I have a sound option. If I'm clicking on a movie clip I get the properties of a movie clip. But when I click on a frame I get properties for a frame of which one of those properties happens to be sound. So then I can choose the sound I want and I'm going to choose the short sound for now. And we have a few other options here that we will look at and we will see that there's a little something that occurred in the timeline here. If I add a few more frames, you will see that it's giving me a basic waveform showing me that sound. So we can see that that sound is existing for the duration of those frames. And it extends out to approximately uh, six seconds. And we can see that this particular sound, it's even telling me the sound I chose is a 44 16 bit sound. So CD quality stereo sound, and it is six seconds long. And we can see that it is now represented in the timeline here as a six <coughs> second sound. So that works out 
nicely. There I have six seconds of music. Periodically, while you're working in Flash, you may need some sound effects. You can go find them online. You can use our uh, local network server that has sound effect files on it. They're limited, but they're there. But if we also look in Flash, we will see under Window Common Libraries, you'll see that there is a Sounds Library. And if I select that, You can see that there's any number of sounds to choose from here. Now, if you're lucky, there's the type and kind of sound that you need for your project, if you're lucky. But more often than not, the sound isn't going to be there. But if you do find something that you want, so if we want to find a sound, so I can get a nice little dinging sound. So if I find a song, song, sound that I like, none of these are particularly exciting, but they give me a little bit, oh, let's see, how's my machine gun? Not very machine gun-ish, but that's okay. I am going to grab this, uh, weapon sword hit metal sound and I can drag it to my library you can see now the sound is in my library I'm just going to stash that palette over here so I can gain access to it again if I so choose I will add another layer I'm calling it sword though I'm really dubious of that being a real sword clanging sound because it's not very convincing but we'll, we'll roll with it for now and if I want that sound to play at a particular moment in time I need to add a keyframe at the moment I want that sound to play so if I know that I want that sound to play at frame 42 right here I can insert a keyframe click on that frame and go into my property panel and choose off of my list of sounds I can choose that sound we can see there it is a nice short sound now while I scrub the timeline here you will notice that we don't hear any sound which can make this a little bit hard you can go by the visual you can look at the waveform you can see the little squiggly line and go okay that's what the sound is all right yeah I'm good but it's not really very useful that way so sometimes we want to hear the sound. Well, in the past, if you've hit return or enter on your keyboard, it starts your project playing, and now we will have to listen to our six second music clip here. And there it is. So now it played. So I'll play it again. So I played, I stopped, and you'll notice that the music is still playing. It played out its full six seconds for me. The problem that we're running into is how we've told the music to play. Now I'm going to take this and I'm going to shorten this up so it's a little bit shorter here. So we can see that even though we know that music was six seconds long, we can see I've shortened it up now down to uh, 2.4 seconds, so not even half of what the music is. We see the sword clang. You can hear that when I hit return. And the music is still playing because, and here's the because. The music is set to sync based on an event. The event it's syncing on is the entering of the frame that the music has been attached to. So if I start right here with my play, no music played because we never entered the frame, frame one, that contained the start of the music. Now if I start right here and then go and let it play frame 42, we get to hear the sword sound because it did enter that frame. 
So the sound, the syncing, has been set to event. We have a couple of different options here of event, start, stop, and stream. And each one is going to give us a different result. So this particular one now, as it goes out 2.4 seconds long, if we even move this keyframe back, get rid of even a few more frames here. So it's much shorter. So we can see that now I'm one second long here and the audio is in frame one, but if I start at frame two, we never entered frame on frame one, therefore the event that triggers the sound never occurred. Now if we remember that flash movies will keep looping unless you tell them otherwise through code, through programming, so they will keep looping. So if I test my movie, command enter, eventually it starts to get a little bit out of hand here. So I ended up with a copy of the music playing over the copy of a music playing over the copy of the music playing over the copy of the music. Every second it added a new copy of the sound up to six copies being a six second sound. If it had a longer sound it would have become even more obnoxious as far as because the sound would have kept playing out and playing out and it would get really really hard to hear what is going on. So the sound does not currently stop yet. We have my two layers of sound. My sword clang stops, but the other sound does not. And the sword clang stops simply because it's short enough versus how many frames it's exposed for. But my music here is six seconds long and I'm only showing it for one second. So it's going to keep playing over and over and over. But we can change what we want to have happen. So currently if the sound is set to start playing on the event of entering that frame. But we can change it and we could say start. So what that will do is that will start the sound when it hits that frame. So it started the sound and it played the sound through in its entirety before it would allow a new copy of the sound to start over. So that's what start does. It won't allow multiple versions of the same thing to play on top of itself. So that works okay, but even with start, I scrub my timeline, I still can't hear it, which makes it really hard when I'm trying to go, what is the sound I hear versus what am I looking at in my animation and making sure the two line up. The better option in that time then is to not use event, not use start, but to use stream. So when we set it to stream, I can now scrub the timeline. And as I scrub the timeline, grab the playback head, we can hear the sound playing back. That's ex extremely useful when you're dealing with dialogue, when you have a talking character and you're trying to figure out what is being said at that precise moment, you scrub the timeline, hear the voice, and then animate accordingly. I can even set my sound effect to be set to stream. and. If you go backwards, it will play the sound in reverse. So if you did have dialogue, you could now scrub backwards and hear what you sound like if you're talking backwards, which can be kind of fun sometimes. And we'll find out if you're speaking any type of evil messages or other things like that when you're played back in reverse. So to recap on that, sound is a property of a frame. So you have a keyframe. Then you can choose the sound that you want. And then if you set the sync mode to stream, when you scrub the timeline, it will then play it. Now it also, unlike start, which will start playing the sound and then not allow a new copy to play over, 
it only will play it for the frames that it's visible on the timeline. So if I go through and shorten my sound so that the first sound is only exposed for nine frames, we can see it goes away and it doesn't play. So it only plays for the frames that we get to see it. So that we have now control over when that sound is appearing or being heard. So one of the purposes of using that face is if you have the background here, if I have this artwork, now the mouth is here and now with this if I want to work with this and animate it, what I can do quite nicely is I can say create motion tween, extend that out, and what flash does at this point is I can move this mouth to create basic talking kind of character. So if you've ever watched an old Monty Python movie like Monty Python and the Holy Grail, they will use artwork that they bring in and then they make them talk with the wiggling chin style of animation. And now I'm just going to set these sounds back to events so I don't have to listen to them while I scrub the timeline. But we will see how now we get the wiggly mouth. Oh, and now I forgot. There we go. Six seconds. Start here. So we can see get the wiggly mouth going on which starts to create the illusion of a character speaking. If you just wiggle it up and down while voice is coming out, it does work surprisingly well without you having to have individual mouth shapes for the different phonetic sounds. And that can be a quick and easy way to go about doing it. Now, as your projects are asking you to put some credits in, beginning or end, where you give yourself credit, you credit your sources for resources that you brought into your project, if you used any external resources. What works well with that is then add in an additional layer and at the point you want it to start, then you have a keyframe and then you can use some text. Now if you want to do text where you say the and and then you would want this to then scroll up and then you'd have other text, you could if you turn it to a symbol, you can fade it in, you can fade it out, you can move it around the screen. If you just want it to be a big block of text that you scroll, if you have it be tall and vertical, then all you have to do is tween that whole thing across the stage. Uh, I'm going to switch it to black since my background is white here. So if I have my text, and if I want this text to then be centered, that's under paragraph. Oh, I didn't mean to scroll there. So here I have my text. Now one thing about text, text does not have to be converted to a movie clip if you want to do a basic movement tween. But if I want to tween its opacity, so fade it in, fade it out, or something like that, then it would have to be a movie clip. So that is just something to keep in mind with it. So if I'm just going to move it and want scrolling text, I can choose Create Motion Tween on it. If I want to do any sort of fade up, fade out, or anything, then I would want to convert it to a symbol. And if you want to kind of stage it where you fade one thing in and out, then something else in and out, and not just do rolling text or scrolling text, then 
I would recommend you use multiple symbols. But if I want this text now just to, now that it's a symbol, create motion tween, go to the end. Let's see that. Now I have rolling text. Basic movement tween. Now what I could do is if I wanted to modify it so that it does fade in or out, that is alpha, which is under color effect. It's a symbol. When it's a movie clip, movie clips have color effect, color effect, alpha. And then when I choose alpha, pull it down to say about 10% right here at the beginning. And I can barely, I'm going to need to make it a little bit darker than 10% because I can't quite see it right now. So if I want at this point to have it at 100% so it's all the way up. And once that gets above the midline here, if I add in another keyframe hitting F6 so it's set and then I can lower its alpha back down. fades up, is there, fades out. So that's just doing a basic motion tween with a color effect changing its alpha. Now you may be deciding that's going way too fast for credits because you can't read what's on screen. And because it's a tween we can just stretch it out, slow it down about double of what it was before. Still going pretty fast, but I'm going to turn my sound off so we don't have to keep listening to it. And again, if you have a keyframe with sound, if you want no sound, you just go back and choose none. None. can see the credits are smoking by. Probably still too fast, hard to read, but now if the wiggly mouth uh, speaking animation, I need some dialogue to go with it. Have the text rolling by on screen. So that's using the Photoshop layered document allows for easy animation. Putting your text into a movie clip allows for easy animation. And of course, if my project did not have a stage color of white, but had a stage color of black, and then if we look at that text, my credits text, and see that that text is black, we could certainly now modify it. So instead of being black, I had a text color of white. If I want it to be bigger, I can make it bigger might need to adjust my animation now because it's probably not going to move off screen. If I don't like times and want to choose a different font, I can certainly do that. If you choose a creative font that you download, then you need to include a copy of the font with your project when you upload it to D2L because I will need a copy of any fonts that weren't installed on the machines if you choose to include them in your project. So please do that. So if I go find, uh, I'm going to use Lithos as my font. Now if we go back here and see, then comes up. But now it's not, so that really needs to be there. And the final frame needs to be off. Now we can see 
white text on black, making it look more standard cinematic. So that's adding credits. That's dealing with the wiggly mouth uh, face animation technique, adding in sound, and bringing in Photoshop artwork into your project. Uh, one final word about sound. When you do choose to publish your project, you may find that the sound doesn't sound as good as it did when you recorded it. Namely, it sounds really, really bad. And that's because if we look at the published settings for the project, the published settings that Flash is going to use is it's going to convert any audio in your project to an MP3 at a 16 kilobit rate. Now, if we look at the options for bitrate that Flash is giving us, we'll see that's one step away from the absolute worst possible quality. It's sacrificing file size for quality. So my recommendation is go into publish settings and then choose a much higher setting. And if you have done anything with stereo effects with your sound, uncheck the convert stereo to mono but you can leave it at mp3, leave it at fast if you bump it up to 160 or at least something much higher than the real crappy level. 128 is going to generally work as well. And in doing that, you'll have much higher quality sound. Otherwise, you'll record your sound, it will sound good. You bring it into Flash, you test movie, and it sounds like garbage. And you'll be like, what happened? Modify your published settings. Once you do that, those settings then will be saved with the file. So it will be saved with your project. So when you save your project, it will remember that. So you don't have to do that every single time you go to publish. Just do it once, and then you're in good shape.